Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuation of the story, Secret Adversary. Last words were that no one actually saw him pass anything to her, but he might have done so. It seems to me quite likely that he entrusted the papers to this girl, believing that she, as a woman, had a greater chance of bringing them safely to shore. And, by the way, please subscribe to the channel and please share. Lots of shares, please. Please share the videos. Please share the videos. Thank you. Continuation. But, if so, where was the girl? And what had she done with the papers? By later advice from America, it seemed likely that Danvers had been closely shadowed on the way over. Was this girl in league with his enemies? Or had she, in her turn, been shattered and either tricked or forced into handing over the precious packet? We set to work to trace her out. It proved unexpectedly difficult. Her name was Jane Finn, and it duly appeared among the list of the survivors but the girl herself seemed to have vanished completely. Inquiries into her antecedents did little to help us. She was an orphan and had been what we should call over here a pupil teacher in a small school out west. Her passport had been made out for Paris where she was going to join the staff of a hospital. She had offered her services voluntarily, and after some correspondence, they had been accepted. Having seen her name in the list of the saved from the Lusitania, the staff of the hospital were naturally very surprised at her not arriving to take up her billet, and at not hearing from her in any way. Well, every effort hat was made to trace the young lady, but all in vain. We tracked her across Ireland, but nothing could be heard of her after she set foot in England. No use was made of the draft treaty, as might very easily have been done, and we therefore came to the conclusion that Danvers had, after all, destroyed it. The war entered on another phase. The diplomatic aspect changed accordingly and the treaty was never redrafted. Rumours as to its existence were emphatically denied. The disappearance of Jane Finn was forgotten and the whole affair was lost in oblivion. Mr Carter paused and Tuppence broke in impatiently. But why has it all cropped up again? The war's over. A hint of alertness came into Mr Carter's manner. Because it seems that the papers were not destroyed after all, and that they might be resurrected today with a new and deadly significance. Tuppence stared. Mr. Carter nodded. Yes, five years ago, that draft treaty was a weapon in our hands. Today, it is a weapon against us. It was a gigantic blunder. If its terms were made public, it would mean disaster. It might possibly bring about another war, not with Germany this time. That is an extreme possibility, and I do not believe in its likelihood myself, but that document undoubtedly implicates a number of our statesmen, whom we cannot afford to have discredited in any way at the present moment. As a party cry for Labour, it would be irresistible, and the Labour government at this juncture would, in my opinion, be a Grave disability for British trade, but that is a mere nothing to the real danger. He paused and then said quietly, 
you may perhaps have heard or read that there is Bolshevik influence at work behind the present labour unrest. Tuppence nodded. That is the truth. Bolshevist gold is pouring into this country for the specific purpose of procuring a revolution. And there is a certain man, a man whose real name is unknown to us, who is working in the dark for his own ends. The Bolshevists are behind the labour unrest, but this man is behind the Bolshevist. Who is he? We do not know. He's always spoken of by the unassuming title of Mr. Brown. But one thing is certain. He is the master criminal of this age. He controls a marvellous organisation. Most of the peace propaganda during the war was originated and financed by him. His spies are everywhere. A naturalised German asked Tommy. On the contrary, I have every reason to believe he is an Englishman. He was pro-German as he would to be in pro-Boer. What he seeks to attain, we do not know. Probably supreme power for himself of a kind unique in history. We have no clue as to his real personality. It is reported that even his own followers are ignorant of it. Where we have come across his tracks, he has always played a secondary part. Somebody else assumes the chief role. But afterwards, we always find that there has been some non-entity, a servant or a clerk, who has remained in the background unnoticed, and that the elusive Mr. Brown has escaped us once more. Oh, Tuppence jumped. I wonder... Yes? I remember in Mr. Whittington's office, the clerk, he called him Brown. You don't think? Carter nodded thoughtfully. Very likely. A curious point is that the name is usually mentioned. An idiosyncrasy of genius. Can you describe him at all? I really didn't notice. He was quite ordinary, just like anyone else. Mr Carter sighed in his tired manner. That is the invariable description of Mr. Brown. Brought a telephone message to the man, Whittington, did he? Notice a telephone in the outer office? Tuppence thought. No, I don't think I did. Exactly. That message was Mr. Brown's way of giving an order to his subordinate. He overheard the whole conversation, of course. Was it after that that Whittington handed you over the money and told you to come the following day? Tuppence nodded. Yes, undoubtedly the hand of Mr. Brown. Mr. Carter paused. Well, there it is. You see what you are pitting yourselves against. Possibly the finest criminal brain of the age. I don't quite like it, you know. You are such young things, both of you. I shouldn't like anything to happen to you. It won't, Tuppence assured him positively. I'll look after her, sir, said Tommy. And I'll look after you, retorted Tuppence, resenting the manly assertion. Well then, look after each other, said Mr Carter, smiling. Now, let's get back to business. There's something mysterious about this draft treaty that we haven't fathomed yet. We've been threatened with it, in plain and unmistakable terms. 
The revolutionary element is good to declare that it's in their hands and that they intend to produce it at a given moment. On the other hand, they are clearly at fault about many of its provisions. The government consider it as mere bluff on their part and rightly or wrongly have stuck to the policy of absolute denial. I'm not so sure. There have been hints, indiscreet allusions, that seem to indicate that the menace is a real one. The position is much as though they had got hold of an incriminating document but couldn't read it because it was in cipher. But we know that the draft treaty wasn't in cipher. Couldn't be in the nature of things so that won't wash. But there's something. Of course, Jane Finn may be dead for all we know, but I don't think so. The curious thing is that they're trying to get information about the girl from us. What? Yes. One or two little things have cropped up. And your story, little lady, confirms my idea. They know we're looking for Jane Finn. Well, they'll produce a Jane Finn of their own, say at a pensionnat in Paris. <gasps> Tuppen gasped. And Mr Carter smiled. No one knows in the least what she looks like. So that's all right. She's primed with a trumped-up tail, and her real business is to get as much information as possible out of us. See the idea? Then you think, Tuppence paused to grasp the supposition fully, that it was as Jane Finn that they wanted me to go to Paris. Mr. Carter smiled more wearily than ever. I believe in coincidences, you know, he said. Well, said Tuppence, recovering herself, it really seems as though it were meant to be. Carter nodded. I know what you mean. I'm superstitious myself. Luck and all the sort of thing. Fate seems to have chosen you out to be mixed up in this. Tommy indulged in a chuckle. My word, I don't wonder Whittington got the wind up when Tuppence plumbed out that name. I should have myself. But look here, sir. We're taking up an awful lot of your time. Have you any tips to give us before we clear out? I think not. My experts, working in stereotyped ways, have failed. You will bring imagination and an open mind to the task. Don't be discouraged if that does not succeed. For one thing, there is a likelihood of the pace being forced. Tuppence frowned uncomprehendedly. When you had that interview with Whittington, they had time before them. I have information that the big coup was planned for early in the new year. But the government is contemplating legislative action which will deal effectually with a strike menace. They'll get wind of it soon, if they haven't already, and it's possible that that may bring things to a head. I hope it will myself. The less time they have to mature their plans, the better. I'm just warning you that you haven't much time before you, and that you needn't be cast down if you fail. It's not an easy proposition anyway, that's all. Tuppence Rose. I think we ought to be businesslike. What exactly can we count upon you for, Mr Carter? Mr Carter's lips twitch slightly, but he replied succinctly. Funds within reason, detailed information on any point, and no official recognition. 
I mean that if you get yourselves into trouble with the police, I can't officially help you out of it. You're on your own. Tuppence nodded sagely. I quite understand that. I'll write out a list of the things I want to know when I've had time to think. Now, about money. Yes, Miss Tuppence. Do you want to say how much? Not exactly. We've got plenty to go with for the present, but when we want more, it will be waiting for you. Yes, but I'm sure I don't want to be rude about the government if you've got anything to do with it, but you know one really has the devil of a time getting anything out of it. And if we have to fill up a blue form and send it in, and then after three months they send us a green one and so on, well, that won't be much use, will it? Mr. Carter laughed outright. <laughs> Don't worry, Miss Tuppence. You will send a personal demand to me here, and the money in notes shall be sent by return of post. As to salary, shall we say at the rate of three hundred a year, and an equal sum for Mr. Beresford, of course? Tuppence beamed upon him. How lovely. You are kind. I do love money. I'll keep beautiful accounts of our expensive all debit and credit and the balance on the right side and the red line drawn sideways with the totals the same at the bottom. I really know how to do it when I think. I'm sure you do. Well, goodbye and good luck to you both. He shook hands with them and in another minute they were descending the steps of 27 Carl Shorten Terrace with their heads in a whirl. Tommy, tell me at once who is Mr Carter? Tommy murmured a name in her ear. Oh, oh said Tuppence, impressed. And I can tell you, old Bean, he's it. Oh, said Tuppence again. Then she added reflectively, I like him, don't you? He looks so awfully tired and bored, and yet you feel that underneath he's just like steel, all keen and flashing. Oh, she gave a skip. Pinch me, Tommy, do pinch me. I can't believe it's real. Mr Beresford, obliged. Ow, that's enough. Yes, we're not dreaming, we've got a job. And what a job. The joint venture has really begun. It's more respectable than I thought it would be, said Tuppence thoughtfully. Luckily, I haven't got your craving for crime. What time is it? Let's have lunch, eh? The same thought sprang to my mind, of each, Tommy voiced it first. Julius P. Heschmeyer. We never told Mr Carter about hearing from him. Well, there wasn't much to tell, not till we've seen him. Come on, we'd better take a taxi. Now, who's been extravagant? All expenses paid, remember? Hop in. At any rate, we shall make a better effect to arrive in this way, said Tuppence, leaning back luxuriously. I'm sure blackmailers never arrive in buses. We've ceased being blackmailers, Tommy pointed out. I'm not sure I have said Tuppence darkly. On inquiring for Mr. Hirschheimer, they were at once taken up to his suit. His suite. An impatient voice cried, Come in. In answer to the page boy's knock and the lad stood aside to let them pass in, Mr. Julius P. Hirschmeyer was a great deal younger than either Tommy or Tuppence had pictured him. The girl put him down as thirty-five. He was of middle height and squarely built to match his jaw. His face was pugnacious but pleasant. No one could have mistaken him for anything but an American, though he spoke with very little accent. Get my note. Sit down and tell me right away all you know about my cousin. 
your cousin, Xiu Fing, Jane Finn. Is she your cousin? My father and her mother were brothers and sister," explained Mister Hedgemire meticulously. "Oh," cried Tuppins, "then you know where she is?" "No." Mister Hedgemire brought down his fist with a bang on the table. "I'm darned if I do. Don't you?" "We advertise to receive information, not to give it," said Tuppins severely. I guess I know that I can read, but I thought maybe it was a back history you were after, and that you'd know where she was now. Well, we wouldn't mind hearing a back history," said Tuppence guardedly. But Mister Hershmeyer seemed to grow suddenly suspicious. See here," he declared, "this isn't Sicily." No demand in ransom or threatening to crop her ears if I refuse. These are the British Isles, so quit the funny business, or I'll just sing out for that beautiful big British policeman I see out there in Piccadilly. Tommy hastened to explain. We haven't kidnapped your cousin. On the contrary, we're trying to find her. We're employed to do so. Mister Hershmeyer. Leant back in his chair. Put me wise," he said succinctly. Tommy fell in with this demand in so far as he gave him a, a guarded version of the disappearance of Jane Finn, and of the possibility of her having been mixed up unawares in some political show. He alluded to Tuppence and himself as private inquiry agents. Commission to find her, and added that they would therefore be glad of any details Mister Hershmeyer could give them. That gentleman nodded approval. I guess that's all right. I was just a mite hasty, but London gets my goat. I only know little old New York. Just trot out your question, then I'll answer. For the moment, this paralysed the young adventuress. But Tuppence, recovering herself, plunged boldly into the breach with a reminiscent cold from detective fiction. When did you last see the Dees,、uh, um, your cousin? I mean, never seen her," responded Mister Hershmeyer. "What?" demanded Tommy, astonished. Hershmeyer turned to him. "No, sir. As I said before." My father and her mother were brother and sister, just as you might be. Tommy did not correct this view of their relationship, but they didn't always get on together. And when my aunt made up her mind to marry Amos Finn, who was a poor school teacher out west, my father was just mad. Said if he made his pile, as he seemed in a fair way to do. She'd never see a cent of it. Well, the upshot was that Aunt Jane went out west, and we never heard from her again. Join me, join me for the next episode, the next video of Secret Adversary. Ah, it gets more deeper and deeper. Join me for the next video of Secret Adversary. I'll see you then.